And so creativity is strange in that manner too because it's a high risk, high return game. You're a lot safer in your life to find a functioning entity and to operate as a cog within it, as long as the entity keeps functioning. Because if you're creative and you go off on tangents all the time, there's some probability that one of those tangents is going to be exactly what is needed at the time and you're going to become hyper successful as a consequence. But there's much more probability that even though your, some of your ideas might be highly valuable, the probability that this is the right time and place for them is extraordinarily low. So to produce a successful creative product, for example, in the marketplace, you need a ridiculous combination of creativity so that you keep generating ideas and then a, a network around you of people who have skills that you don't and then the production of, a, of a, a product, let's say, whatever that happens to be, that's actually in demand by the marketplace at exactly that moment and that someone else hasn't already done better. So the, the sensible thing to tell anybody who wants to be creative is, that's stupid. You shouldn't do it. It's, it's, your probability of success is so low that it's better just to do something sensible. But the problem with that is that creative people can't do that because they're creative. And if they shut down their creativity, it's like an extrovert who's gone to live in, a, you know, in an isolated cell. A creative person who isn't being creative, they just, they just wither and die. So they're stuck with it. So, but it is a high risk, high return strategy. So probably better if you want to be creative or if you are, and, and you should take this advice to heart because I've been watching people for a long time. If you want to engage in a creative pursuit, you should find something stable to do that will generate you an income and you should pursue the thing that you're creative about on the side because monetizing creative production is so bloody difficult that especially now, like especially in like artistic domains, generation of music and that sort of thing, it's like you just have no idea how many million songs there are on the internet and the vast majority of them commercially available get downloaded zero times. Like 80, per, I think there's 80 million songs or something like that on the net. And I believe it's something in the neighborhood of 70 million get downloaded zero times. And then there's a hundred that can get downloaded like 350 million times. And so those people are wildly successful and everyone else collapses in failure. So, okay. So now there's a number of things to consider if you're thinking about performance prediction. And one of them is to what degree do people vary in terms of their performance capacity? And you might say, well, there's very little performance variability, or you might say there's a tremendous amount of per performance variability, or you might say there's an absurd amount of performance variability. And it turns out that the claim that there's an absurd amount of performance variability is the proper claim. IQ is normally distributed, so is conscientiousness, but productivity is distributed along the Pareto distribution, and I'll show you why. And that follows a law called Price's Law from someone named Derek DeSola Price, who was studying scientific productivity in the early 1960s. And what he showed was that a vanishingly small proportion of the scientists operating in a given scientific domain produced half the output. And so what you see, and this, what's happening is that to do really well at a given productive task, which would also include generating money as a, as a proxy for, for, for creative productivity, is that you have to be, a bunch of things have to go your way simultaneously. So maybe you have to be really, really smart, you have to be really, really lucky, you have to be really healthy, you have to be really energetic, you have to be really conscientious, you have to be in the right time at the right place. And maybe you also have to have the right social network, right? Like, so it's a lot of things, and each of those are sort of small probability they're, they're each of those are small probabilities, and then if you multiply the small probabilities together, you get an extraordinarily tiny probability. And you have to have all those things functioning before you're going to end out on the, on, the, on the extreme end of the productivity distribution. But if you do end up there, then you produce almost all of everything. So it's a tiny number of people that produce almost all of everything. That's Price's law. And technically it is, and I, I mentioned this to you before, it's the square root law. The square root of the number of people in a productive domain produce half the output, right? So if you have 10 employees, three of them produce half the output. If you have 100, 10 of them produce half the output. If you have 10,000, 100 of them produce half the productive output. And so what that also means is that because there's massive variability in performance, you don't have to shift your ability to predict performance very, very, very much up towards being better at it to gain substantially on the positive side because there's so much difference in productivity. And that actually happens to be 
also a function of the complexity of the job. If the job is simple, which is, means you can, this job has 10 rules, you know, maybe that's a janitorial job, let's say. You know, you do, you, it takes a little while to learn it, but once you've learned it, you basically do the same thing all the time. There's not a lot of performance variability in those jobs, and most of that would be eaten up by conscientiousness, and also to some degree by neuroticism, because the higher, people who are higher neuroticism would be more likely to miss work. But, you're, but, but general cognitive ability, for example, is not a good predictor at all. It'll predict how fast you learn the tasks initially, but not how well you perform the tasks. But if the tasks you're doing are shifting constantly, so your responsibilities change, or you're in a creative job where you're constantly solving new problems, those are kind of the same thing, then uh, IQ, as the complexity of the job increases, the predictive utility of IQ increases, which is only to say that smarter people can handle complex situations faster. It's like, that doesn't seem like a particularly radical claim. So, Price's law dictates that there's massive individual productivity differences between people, so increasing your, predictive, your capacity for predicting performance, even by small increments, has a huge economic consequence. That was established in the 1990s. The equations were first developed in the 1990s, and that's part of the reason that I started working on performance prediction tests, because I read the economics and I thought, oh my god, you can produce a test that costs $30 times, say, maybe you have 50 applicants for the position, $1,500 to administer, and it'll produce an increments of something like 30% of salary permanently for the person that you put in the position. So let's say you hire a $75,000 employee, and it increases their productivity by 30%, so we'll say roughly $25,000. You get a $25,000 return on a $1,500 investment every single year that person occupies the position. On average, that's four years. That's a $100,000 payoff for your $1,500 investment. I read that and I thought, oh, that'll be easy to sell. It's like, wrong, wrong. Even though the economic payoff was so massive, I, I told you the other impediments that, that emerged. But the, the arithmetic, or the capacity to produce these calculations was established in the, in the 1990s. And I'll show you the equations in a, in a bit here. Okay, so we already talked about what a normal distribution looks like. That's the red line. And a normal distribution emerges as a consequence of chance processes. So we'll take a look at those here. All right, so here's a Pareto distribution. This is the distribution. Remember I showed you with the creative achievement questionnaire that almost everybody stacked up at zero? People have zero creative output. The median person has zero lifetime creative output. And then there's a tiny proportion that are way the hell out on the you know, right-hand end of the distribution, right? Those are the people have, who have, everything is cycling forward for them. And as they get more well-known, of course, they get more opportunities as well. So I just, I'll just run this simulation for you, okay? And, and this shows you why the Pareto distribution emerges. Now you have to watch this quickly because it's a fairly fast animation. So here's what happens. Everybody starts out with $10. There's a, there's a thousand people playing the game. Everybody starts out with $10. We, I have a dollar, you have a dollar, I flip a coin. If I get heads, you give me a dollar. If, if, you, if I get tails, I give you a dollar. We, we go around and we trade with everyone. Okay, so the first thing that happens when people start to trade is this. Normal distribution develops, right? Because some people lose and some people win. It's just like the golden board that I showed you. Okay, so you keep playing. People start to stack up at zero. Watch. Because they lose 10 times in a row. Bang, they're done. The bottom graph is a graph of the entropy of the distribution, which increases as the game continues. Because at the beginning, it's maximally ordered, right? Everybody has exactly the same amount. Now it's being distributed. Same equations apply to the distribution of gas into a vacuum. Well, what happens? Now someone, you know, there are people out there at the, at the $50 range, or at the $60 range, or at the $70 range. You keep playing it. Well, eventually what happens, if you play it right to its conclusion, is that one person ends up with all the money. So that's, to those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken. That's the law of economic productivity. It's called Matthew, it's the Matthew principle. Um, and it's actually an economic principle that was derived from a saying in the New Testament. I'll tell you some more about this on Tuesday, because I didn't get through all of it. And I, want to, I want to finish up the performance prediction lecture um, and show you a couple of things I didn't get to show you the last time that we talked. And then I want to do the closing lecture since we're done today. So we'll start with the, the performance prediction 
end. So I've been thinking more about this Pareto distribution issue because it's it's a really big deal, and and I it's it's difficult. It's still difficult for me to understand. See, I didn't really learn about this till about 10 years ago, which is quite a shock to me because it's such a fundamental phenomenon that it seems to me that it would have been addressed in my training somewhere along the way. And so, um, and so I'm still thinking it through, what it means exactly. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting thing. You know that IQ is normally distributed and it's a good predictor of long-term performance. And conscientiousness is normally distributed, and it's a good predictor of long-term performance. And, and, and openness is also uh, normally distributed, and it's a good predictor of creative behavior. But creative output is not normally distributed. It's distributed in this weird Pareto distribution that, that's indexed here. And I showed you that with the Creative Achievement Questionnaire, most specifically, because that provides a really concrete example of it. Um, so it looks like the capacity to think creatively might be normally distributed. That would be openness, say, and intelligence. But the consequence of that turns into this strange Pareto distribution. And the Pareto distribution with regards to creative achievement was best, the, 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 the catastrophe of it in some sense is best indexed by the fact that if I remember correctly, 70% of people who complete the creative achievement questionnaire, which indexes lifetime creativity, score zero. So, and zero is a strange number, you know, zero isn't like other numbers. And the, the part of the reason for that is that it's difficult to do anything with nothing. So, you know, if you, if you buy a stock and the, and the price sinks to like two cents a stock, you're still alive. But if the price sinks to zero, you're done, right? That's it. The, the game's over. And that's the thing about zero. When, when you're hit zero, or maybe when you're at zero, the game is over. And so there's these weird barriers to moving forward in life. And you see this, there's a poverty trap that's sort of like this too. Like if you're, if you're so broke that you can't keep up with paying your bills, it's really, really difficult to get out of that because you can't get a bank account, for example, and you can't pay your rent. To a certain, and th there's, there's, there's economies of scale that you can't take advantage of because you don't have any money at all. And so you can't get going in the game. And then, so there's the problem of starting out with zero, which is a big problem and very difficult to get out of. And then there's the problem of falling to zero if you are in the game, because when you fall to zero, then it's very difficult to get going again. And so, now I, I, I want to show you something about how, how trading games work. Um, so I think we, st we closed with this last time, but so this is a, this is a graph that shows you how a monopoly game starts, roughly speaking, but you could say, this is how you would set up the world if you wanted perfect equity, if you wanted everybody to have the same outcome, everybody would have uh, the same amount of money. In this case, it's $10. And so it's, it's, it's dollars along the, along the bottom axis and it's number of players along the left-hand axis. And you can think about this as a monopoly game. Everybody starts with the same amount of money and then you start trading randomly. And you know, if, if, if you have $10 and you're trading a dollar each trade, if you have enough people, some unlucky person is going to end up with zero dollars after 10 trades. And if they end up with one dollar after nine trades, they still have a chance of recovery. It's a low chance, but it's not zero. But once they hit zero, they're out of the game. And so what happens is if you run this simulation, you have people flip a coin to determine how they're going to trade, then this is what happens. So the first thing that happens is you generate a normal distribution because some people win and some people lose and most people sort of half win and half lose but some lose continually and some win continually and so it turns into a normal distribution. That's fine but then when the game continues to play then what happens is that people start to stack up on the zero end of things and a, a tiny proportion at the upper end and if you play the game right to cessation which is what you do if you play Monopoly for example somebody ends up with all the money. And the funny thing about playing Monopoly, as you know, if you've played Monopoly multiple times, is that the probability that you'll win continually across games is pretty low. You know, it, there's a lot of randomness in Monopoly, and if you play with the same five people, ten games, the probability is pretty good you're not going to win more than two games. So, so there's chance elements that come into play that determine the outcome. And, and so anyways, I, I was thinking about this more, a little bit more last night, and somebody asked me, I was talking about it with somebody, and uh, he, he asked me if the Pareto distribution was a necessary consequence of the fact that production is number one, measured, and number two, social. And that's, that, I thought that was a really interesting question. It's like, do you get a Pareto distribution every time creative output ends up being measured in some way? And even if you can conceptualize it, 
so because it might be the the idea might be that anything that you can assign monetary value to is first of all is something you can measure because assigning monetary value to something is in fact measuring it right you're measuring it with money and then as soon as you assign a monetary value to it you can you can trade it you can trade it and it also takes on some aspects of a zero sum game and most of the things that we talked about with regards to um, the production of Pareto distributions were measured entities and were um, were were trading games as well so even because I, I mentioned to you for example that number of, of basketball hoops successfully managed in, by NBA players is Pareto distributed but that's also those are measurable with money because of course you get paid to do it and it's a, and it is a social game and so maybe it is an inevitable consequence of trading in a social game that you produce Pareto outcomes and then I was trying to figure out why and I've, I've, I've always had the suspicion that what happens to people is that as they move towards zero positive feedback loops get set up so they're more likely to hit zero and as they move away from zero positive feedback loops get set up so that they're increasingly more likely to move away from zero you guys are going to have a hell of a time monetizing your creativity it's virtually impossible it's really really difficult because first of all let's say you make an original product you think the world will beat a pathway to your door if you build a better mousetrap it's like that's complete rubbish it isn't it, it isn't true in the least if you make a good creative product, you've probably solved about 5% of your problem. Because then you have marketing, which is insanely difficult, and then you have sales, and then you have customer support, and then you have to build an organization. And you have to, if it's really novel, you have to tell people what the hell the thing is. You know, we built this future authoring program, right? And we, uh, it's, uh, it's available for people online. So how do you market that? No one knows what that is, and that's a real problem. If you write a book, well, then you have the problem that another million people have also written a book. But if you produce something that's completely new and doesn't have a category, people can't search for it online. How are they going to find it? So you, you just have, and then you have pricing problems, and it's really unbelievably difficult to produce something creative and then monetize it. And even worse, if you're the creative person, let's say you have a spectacular invention. You've got no money, right? You've got no customers. Th those are big problems. And so maybe you go and you find a venture capitalist. We start with family and friends, because that's how it works. You raise money for your product. You raise money from your family and friends. That's assuming you have family and friends that have some money and that they're going to give it to you. And most people aren't in that situation. So it's a terrible barrier right off the bat. And then, of course, you're putting your family and friends at substantial financial risk, because the probability that your stupid idea is going to make money is virtually zero, even if it's a really brilliant idea. And so then let's say, well, you get past family and friends and you get venture capital, capitalists involved because that's often the next step. Or an angel investor. That's, there's, a, there's steps in building a business. Family and friends, angel investor, that's some rich guy that you've happened to meet, some manner, some way who's, who's into this sort of thing and is willing to provide you with some money to get your product off the ground. Well, how much of your product is that person going to take? Well, most of it. Most of it. And then if you get a venture, and no wonder, because, you know, you don't have any money. How are you going to bargain for control over your product? He'll just say, well, do you want the money or not? And if your answer is no, then he'll go and do something else with his money. It's not like there's no shortage of things that you can do with your money. There's a million things you can do with it. So you're not in a great bargaining position. And then if you get venture capitalists involved, they'll take another big chunk. And maybe if they're not very straight with you, they'll just throw you out. Because maybe by that point in the company's development, you're nothing but a pain in the neck. Because what do you know about marketing and sales and customer service and building an organization and running a business? Like, you don't have a clue. So why do they need you? So even if you're successful at generating a new idea and you put it into a business, the probability that you, as the originator of the, of the idea, are going to make some money from it is very, very low. So don't be thinking that creativity is such a is such a is something you would want to curse yourself with now you know it's not all bad because it, it opens up avenues of experience for creative people that aren't available to people who aren't creative but it definitely is a high risk high return strategy you know so the overwhelming probability is that you will fail but a small proportion of creative people succeed spectacularly and so it's like a lottery in some sense you're probably gonna lose but if you don't lose you could win big and that keeps a lot of creative people going. But also, they don't really have much choice in it. Because if you're a creative person, you're like a, a, a fruit tree that's, that's bearing fruit. So you don't really have, you can suppress it, but it's very bad for you. 
you know, the creative people I've worked with is if they're not creative, they're miserable, so they have to do it. But, and, and you know, there's real joy and, and pleasure in it and, 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 and psychological utility. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's an intelligent, it's certainly not a conservative strategy for moving forward through life. So, and you know, whenever I talk to people who are creative, and you, you guys should listen to this because I know what I'm talking about. If you happen to be creative, if you're a songwriter, or another kind of musician, or an artist, or, or, or any of the other number of things that you might be. Find a way to make money, and then practice your craft on the side, because you will starve to death otherwise. Now, some, for some of you, that won't be true, but it's a tiny minority. Your best bet is to find a job that will keep body and soul together, and parse off some time that you can pursue your creative thing, because then, well, as a long-term strategy, a medium to long-term strategy, it's a better one. But it's got incredibly difficult for people, musicians for example, it's incredibly difficult for new musicians to monetize their, their craft, even if they're really, really good at it. This business has always been weird like that. There's always no, been that's people. why you're the king, dude, because you got outside of it, but you're totally in it, and they can't, they can't get you. They can't get you. I, 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 you know, I'm piling up some stories here, being in the matrix. I won't get into them, but it's the same, it's just the same old corporations only know how to do business one fucking way and well, it's just they it's, push their advantage they push their advantage they have their leverage and they want the biggest pie, slice of the pie that's that's what they do. i don't have a problem with that it's when they go beyond that and they just straight up steal are they stealing from they, you right they, everybody does every every time you get in business with like corporate guys this is how it works it's like the check okay we're in business to make money from them and then you get in business with them and then the check goes to the corporate guy and then you get your cut off of his checkbook so right there, I am immediately in a situation where there's no way I can steal from him, but he can rob me fucking blind. Right. And yeah. he can add a bunch of expenses yeah, onto things that... Front end load yes. expenses to make yes. it look like they're losing money. And yeah. That's to, Hollywood accounting. Yeah. No, yeah. it's stealing. It's stealing is what yes. it is. They just call it Hollywood accounting. Yes. But, it, but it's not Hollywood accounting. It's, it's corporate accounting. It's scumbag accounting. That's just... And it's how they do it, and they sleep at night, and then they always ask, oh, that's over in the accounting section of the building, not over here where me and my yacht are. <laughs> I'm like artist-friendly. You know, I majored in fucking liberal arts in college. Well, what was really interesting, when podcasts started to take off, they started to try to get in with the old model and weasel into podcasts and, and buy pieces of podcasts. And, like, if you oh, come dude, your on deal, my network... Your deal is going to... If you think the fucking industry is going to sit back when they didn't get to wet their beak on that thing, I'm going to tell every young comic when we get back to this shit, is what they're going to do now is what the music industry did, where they started, started signing straight across the board deals. They're going to get some young kid who's got no power in the business and it's just like, you know, we'll help you create a podcast, you know, so we're signed with so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. And what they're going to do is they're going to own the podcast, the advertising money is going to go to them and they're going to rob them fucking blind. They're 100%. Gonna, they're going to 100%, 100% going to fucking steal from them, rob them fucking blind. And then when they get audited and they get caught stealing, they're going to label that kid, that young comic, difficult to work with, <laughs> meaning difficult to steal from. That's It's already happening. Yeah. Uh, I know guys who young guys I won't name any names, but they've come up to me and go. Hey um, I'm signed to this management company. They want to sign me, but they want a piece of my podcast No, they want a piece of this and they they want there's it. There's no perpetuity. reason. There's no reason Yeah, you got to tell people that dude, oh, cause you're them. the you got to tell, oh, I tell you got to tell people do I not tell them, don't give up anything don't give up anything. Don't ever. It's all you. It's all Because they're not going to do anything for you. They, they, what they're going to do is move the ball quicker yeah. that first fucking two years, and then the rest is all going to be you. If you just hang in there and, and struggle a little bit, like, uh, uh you got to grind. You just got to hang in there and keep going. I mean, yeah. I, I got a lot of offers to buy half of the podcast or to buy, P and I, nothing. I wouldn't, I won't, I won't do it. I won't, I'll never do it. But then Spotify came along and they said, we'll give you a licensing deal. So just put it on our network for yeah. three months, but you still own it. Right. I'm like, all right, we're in. And that's that's why we did it that way. But this this comic that I won't name, he was telling me that his, this management company, they wanted to sign him. They wanted to own a piece of his podcast forever. And I'm and like, that is And what that eventually crazy. will become, yeah, because what they're going to look at it is they're going to make it like if you started a podcast while you were with this yes. manager or while you were with this agent, it'll be like back in the day when you booked a sitcom. Exactly. And then- 
if you left the agency or the manager throughout the lifetime of that sitcom, you owed the commission to them. Exactly. But back then, that you needed them to do that. You don't need them for the podcast, but they're going to do that. So then you're going to leave this manager, and then for the rest of your fucking life, you're going to be paying this never-ending alimony. Yeah. I mean, there'll be guys, eventually, they'll try to take 50, 60, I own your podcast. Uh-huh. Yeah. Managers will start, um, agents will start podcast networks, because there's nobody regulating them. To not do that anymore. It I got seems. an offer just five years ago from a company that was a radio company that wanted 50% of the podcast. They were going to give me no money. They wanted 50% of the podcast just to be associated with them. And they're like, we're going to pull together all these advertisers and it's going to help your revenue. No. 50%. So no. that, and they never the deliver with what they say they're going to. And they then can't. they come they in can't. and they just, they just, they gut the thing. Well, the th- beautiful thing about podcasts is podcasts all get big on word of mouth. Like, I've never advertised this podcast. I never did anything with it. Right. I never bought billboards or put ads up anywhere. It's just from word of mouth. And the way other podcasts grow is people get on people's podcasts and they say, hey, you listen to Bill Burr's podcast, Money Morning Podcast, fucking hilarious. And then it just right. grows from But I think it's the job promoting. of people making money in podcasting to let new podcasters know, do not sign those yes. deals ever. Yes. Do not let the fox into the hen house because they are going to fucking rob you Blind. And they you just, don't need them. And I, I saw this documentary one time on this heavy metal band Anvil, right? This crazy thing about this band that just was around forever and never quite made it. And there was a, I think it was, I think it was that one. It's one of those ones about an old like metal band from the '80s. And this guy said, like the truest shit ever when he was talking about the music business. And this goes straight across podcasts and everything. He goes, "You're better to own something 100 percent and only sell 20,000 copies than you are to uh, not own it at all." And sell twenty million. Like you're literally gonna make more if you just sell twenty. Isn't twenty that crazy. Yeah, no, they fuck. Cause and then another thing that they do. Oh my god, dude. Another thing that they do is then the all the people that they lose on, they dump that on you. Yes. Yes. Like I remember one time, I forget what it, I I was uh, with this network and I had a CD that was already made. I already made it, and I just wanted them to put it out on their label, and they and they wanted to own the CD. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm not, no, I don't want you to own it. I just need you to, to, to like distribute it. I need you as a distributor. And the guy said to me, he goes, well, you know, ownership shouldn't be that big a deal for you. It should be about exposure. I said, all right, well, let me ask you this. If ownership shouldn't be that big a deal to me, why is it such a big deal to you? And he started like stammering. And then he basically said, well, you know, we get in business with something. He named a couple other comics whose CDs didn't sell. And we have to recoup those losses. It's like, that ain't my fault. That's hilarious. I could have told you not to sign that fucking jerk <laughs> off. What is your... It's not my fault you didn't do the, the fucking work. So that's the way... <clears throat> I had another one one time I signed with. This is back when I made like CDs and I did one and I had a 60-40. You get... You know, I was getting 60 and they were getting 40. But their 40 was off the gross. Mine was off the net. And all expenses for the album was on me. It's like, I thought we were doing this together. Every fucking thing, the artwork, printing it, all of that, all of those expenses came to me. And in the end, that 60, 40, 60 uh, net, 40 gross, they made way more money than I did. <sighs> it's just how they, and you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm getting $6 on every 10. Yeah, plus the, it, but anything. It's just hilarious that they would come up to you and tell you that we did some deals with some other comics. Dude, I got in business one time profitable. to make this TV show and the fucking guy sends this, the, the, the bill for the whole fucking thing. I shouldn't be saying that, but this is a while ago, right? The guy was going to bill us 2500 bucks a month to use his copier machine and another, I don't know, 4500 bucks to use his editing. It's like, dude, we have both of those things. We don't need those. Let's take that money and put it on the screen. We're trying to get this thing to go. And and the guy, like, he, he, oh, it's the funniest shit ever. He goes, like, I'm insulted by those questions or something like that, which is my favorite thing ever. <laughs> the, the, the offense, like the, uh, what is the, like, the, 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 I don't know. You're a fucking thief, and you actually have the audacity <laughs> to be like taken aback, like like fanning yourself. Like I can't believe you'd such a. It's like it's t- how many fucking shows are you charging twenty five hundred bucks a month to go? You know, fucking use your copy machine. Yeah, uh, that's a lot of money. That's rent for a nice apartment. <laughs> no fucking thieves. <laughs> fucking copy machine. How much does it cost to use that copy machine? Really? First of all, the copy machine probably doesn't even cost twenty five hundred bucks. It's probably renting it. Yeah. 
Probably rents it for a couple hundred bucks a fucking month. But even to buy a copy. He probably has nine shows paying 2,500 bucks a month for him to go, that's it. If you have like a really big one, one of those commercial grade copy machines, what does it cost? 10 grand? I mean, how much could it cost? I mean, that, I, I think he's bought a couple of houses off of owning that <laughs> copier machine. And I just, I just love telling these fucking stories because these are the things that you like. What, what's great about podcasting is you can say yeah. this. This is for every person out there who yes. has a fucking business. And, you know, there's that thing where you want to take it to the next level. And then these, these guys come in and then they're all just like, yeah, well, hey, we're going to take a piece of it. And they take a big fucking chunk out of it. And what they do is their risk is all the way down here. Yours is up here. And then somehow they just, I'm telling you, like, you better, you better just sell 20,000 copies, own it 100% than 20 million and not own any of it. Because yeah. you're going to make more money. That's just how the game is played. And those fucking guys who steal from people, they, they sleep very comfortably. But it's also just podcasts, just the stress of dealing with other people's eliminated. Just the stress of dealing with production people. It slows it down. It slows oh, it down. Yeah, it slows it's awful. It down. It's awful. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the only thing Spot Spotify's ever done so far is ask, do you know who the first guest will be? And already I'm like, ugh. <laughs> Yeah. Like, they're going to be who they're going to be. You know, they're going to be great. I'm going to try to I get call my best that, friends, I call the that, funniest people. That's them justifying their desk. Like, I right, can't just right, sit here right. like, Joe knows what Any he's idea? doing. Any idea? Well, who's so, uh, going to be? I'd like to start an uh, email <laughs> chain, and uh, we could maybe circle back later and uh, have a conference call. <laughs> and they're just trying to fill up yes. their... Yeah, they're just having to use time. Yeah. But, the, but the Spotify people have been great. They literally said, we don't want to do anything. We want you to just do what you're doing. Just do what you're doing. Oh, that's but good. even asking me who the guest's going to be, I was like, oh, no. Please let this be the only question. <laughs> yeah. I'm never available. And that's nothing, though. That's nothing. I mean, they're great. But could you imagine if you were doing that with a network? Like, imagine if you were in business with ABC or something like that, and they were, they were helping produce your podcast. You'd have to go in for meetings. You'd have to go in and sign into the office. Bill, you sign in here. You go and sit down and waste your fucking afternoon having some dopey conversation. You, you, you kind of complain a lot when you read these letters. Bill, um, do you have to when people are signing the emails? Maybe you should be. Can we get happier? a reread on the blah blah blah? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, what do you think? How do you feel about product placement? Because we've got a we've got a great deal with Coca Cola. <laughs> <laughs> Look, all I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to tell a few of those for younger people out there because it actually really bothers me that people do that to people. Yes. It really it bothers me and I love comics and I love seeing new comics coming up that have talent and I hate seeing them get fucked over. So hopefully uh, people listen and they do it, but they're fucking worms, man. They're, they're fucking worms. worms. There's a lot of worms out there. And there's a lot of worms that try to grab comics real that, that are talented but real raw. And they try to lock you up to some enormous lifetime management deal. And, and when you take off and you have something, say if you're... <clears throat> Dude, I remember back in the day when everyone, when, when companies were like shooting specials before comics started shooting them, and the amount of guys that got that, yeah, we only got enough money for, to shoot one, you know, to only, you can only shoot it one time, but you're going to crush it, man. You got this hour down, we only got enough in the budget. And then they'd show up early and they'd be shooting another comic special. Off yes. their money, the deal, to double them as a management company, what they would get, or, or an agency. The amount of fucking times that that happened. With the same audience. Oh, I mean, yeah. yeah. Oh, you want to yeah. hear the best one I ever heard? Jim Brewer was filming a special, f sold out this theater, and the, the people that were filming the special told him that the money for the ticket sales was theirs because it was all about the production. Because the money that people were paying for the production, he's like, the fuck are you talking about? This is my audience. Like, that's my money. His management tried to steal the money from ticket sales and say that it went towards production. Uh, went all the way to court with it. His manager's on the way to court, has a fucking panic attack, <laughs> goes to the hospital. Like, the whole thing's a nightmare. I think he won. won. Yeah, yeah, of course he won. He won. Yeah, he won. It, well, it's, it's, it's thievery. It's thievery. Like these are tick people are paying to see Dude, Jim I have Brewer. I have a million of those fucking stories. And that this, but this is the thing. This is what kills me about a lot of this this rhetoric that's going on out there, which I agree with ninety percent of it, but if you if you agree with a hundred percent of it, like you and I are not supposed to be having stories like this. We're supposed to be the ones doing it. 
And it's just like you have what do you to mean? Uh, like as far as the uh, the whole, you know, oh, you're a white male heterosexual, you know, doors just fly open and <clears> people are like, hey, what do you dream? They like I'm, I'm not saying and I'm not obviously not bitching, but I'm just saying that like like people will fuck you. It's all about money. They it's don't. All about money. They don't give a fuck, and they and they all those people that do that shit really. Yeah. So well, there's I, a long I, history of Hollywood accounting. There's a long history of that. I mean, there's been so many stories about people who made killer hit movies and never got paid because Hollywood's like, look, you know, we had this much had to go to advertising, and this is the production. Look guy. how bad Elvis Ooh. got fucked. Oh yeah. Oh, Elvis yeah. got fucked so bad, and then one of the main re- ways he got fucked on the road, he he only did one. Out of the country date, I believe he did Toronto, and he never traveled the world because his manager had something going on with his visa, and he was worried if he left, he wouldn't be able to come back. So that kind of like fucked <laughs> him Elvis in out of a ton of fucking money and seeing the world or whatever the yeah. fuck he might have wanted to do. Keep doing these movies, Elvis. You don't want to go on the road. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> well, the, you know, the best version of breaking down how corrupt the music business is was by Courtney Love. They said she had a ghostwriter. I don't know, but she did. But it was, it's, a, it's a great article that she wrote documenting exactly how much you get paid versus how much money gets generated and where it all goes and how they fuck you. Yeah. No, it's... it's uh, they've always done it that way. I mean, that's, that's always the way they've done it. They, that's they the take answer. They these young people. That's the answer yeah. to it is, well, I mean, that's how, that's how it's done. 